The definition of sustainability, which dates back to over 30 years to the so-called Brundtland Commission report, is that sustainability is about meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Unfortunately, the status quo in business and society suggests that such future generations' ability is at a massive risk, due both to the environmental issues like climate change and due to the societal issues, some of which are already driven by climate change and they will be increasing and driven by it in the future. This is why strategic and forward-looking leaders naturally see sustainability as an opportunity as well as risk. Both of these factors call for action, and that's why the topic is so important. Oh, there are many. One example is the various form of zero carbon energy. Now, solar and wind are natural examples, but there are many, many more. There are nuclear reactors of new types and sizes, various kinds of energy storage, and so on. A related set of examples uh, are the different ways to change consumption and production processes to utilize such zero carbon energy, which oftentimes mean, means electricity. For example, if producing steel or cement still requires fossil fuels, then having uh, zero carbon energy, let's say from solar and wind is insufficient. It's also important to update the production processes of these large pollution industries to utilize electricity. In a way, both supply and demand should be there. At a more household level, heat pumps are great examples, especially in mild climates like here in France where we're filming it. New technologies in air conditioning is another close-to-home example. An NGO project drawdown, for example, estimates that improving efficiency of air conditioners will have the biggest impact on climate change mitigation. Yet a separate category are the carbon capture and storage technology. While it's important to, uh, to talk about emitting less carbon, there is already too much carbon in the atmosphere well, and elsewhere, and we need to remove it. Having efficient ways of removing it will also make it less critical to decarbonize processes that are very hard to decarbonize. Then we have hydrogen-related technology, nuclear fusion, and so on. So in sum, there are many. There are many factors that are important as well as their interplay. On one side is costs fixed cost to procure the green technology, and variable cost, cost to run the green technology. On the other side is demand, uh, and in particular, whether these costs could be passed on to consumers. The interplay between the two is important for two reasons. On one end, how will margin be affected, and on the other is how the volume will be affected. A third category is incentives. They can be direct incentive, positive incentives like government subsidies, negative incentives like environmental taxes, as well as various indirect incentives, for example, customer patronage on the positive side or boycotts on the negative side. Now, but more importantly is that the interplay between these can be complex and unintuitive. For example, in one of my research papers uh, titled Environmental Taxes and the Choice of Green Technology, we show that the higher taxes may not necessarily motivate green tech and quite oppositely may motivate the dirty. But, but how can this happen? Right? On the variable cost basis, taxes of course help green tech. Firms that pollute less pay less tax. But these tax payments, big or small, increase the price. And therefore, if they are passed on to consumers, they reduce the quantities that are produced. And such a reduced production volume may not be sufficient to amortize the fixed or green technology. So luckily, this negative fixed cost effect could be dealt with the help of subsidies, which we also show um, um, in this research paper. Multiple subsequent studies uh, including by the former INSEAD faculty and PhD students, showed that conceptually similar effects could also be driven by other elements of green technology. For example, by the intermittency of renewable power supply. Uh, the, the mechanism there is that the more renewable power we have, the more backup generation capacities we need to build to maintain the supply of renewables when they're not producing. By analogy to this fixed cost effect from my work, reducing intermittency also helps uh, uh, in, in this situation, like, for example, with battery storage. Um, and that is, in fact, why we see so much technological progress and investment in battery tech, not just in like EV type or, you know, cell phone, laptop type batteries, but also in large scale industrial batteries, broadly defined, relying on all sorts of physics and chemistry. Um, I talk about some of these technologies in my recent book chapter on green technology adoption for deep decarbonization. There are multiple kinds. Uh, consumer rebates, think of incentives for purchasing electric vehicle. Producer uh, subsidy or tax, we change the variable cost. 
uh, incentives on the fixed cost side, uh, and so on. But to me, the more important question is that why do governments offer this and why are they of interest to the society? Uh, the key word is an externality, which is an indirect effect impact of the activities of one set of economic actors on other actors and possibly even non-actors. Now, think of automobiles. People who drive, they receive benefits, right? They, these benefits are internalized by the people who drive. People that make and sell cars receive uh, revenues. They are as well internalized. People who work for such firms receive salary. Owners of such firm, you know, have valuation to their assets. But everyone, and very importantly, including people who do not drive or who do not work or own for such firms, everybody receives pollution. Right? The indirect cost of such pollution is not factored in to the decision-making process of people who buy and firms who make polluting products. The goal of environmental policy, such as subsidies or taxes, is to internalize the externality. That is to make these indirect costs direct and visible to the economic actors. Now, this will have two effects. One, it will reduce the consumption of polluting goods. And then two, it will make less polluting ways of produce these goods, or generally speaking, less polluting goods, more appealing. That's why we're talking about the green technology adoption. Timing is important, and for two rather different reasons. So first, there is a massive learning by doing. The production of efficiency of essentially everything improves with volume. So early adoption, even in small volumes, help reduce the cost of subsequent larger scale adoption. We very clearly see it with electric vehicles and their batteries, for example. In fact, that's why government incentives are gradually phased out as the technology matures. Second is borrowing time is also important. Think of carbon removal by planting trees. Eventually, these trees will die, rot, and release methane, a massively more potent greenhouse gas uh, with respect to global warming. So why uh, then planting trees still make sense? Because it allows us to buy time. Essentially, we hope that by the time these trees will start to die and rot, we will have better technologies to either capture greenhouse gases or the emissions will be smaller otherwise so that the natural absorption of greenhouse gases will be able to deal with these additional emissions from dying, uh, rotting trees. In sum, timing is important, and it is now, whether it is to learn, to adopt, or just to buy the time. Whether doing nothing is safer depends on the time horizon. For one who thinks only about today, this quarter, or maybe even next year or so, doing nothing is perhaps safer. But if we go back to the definition of sustainability, meeting the needs of present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That is, once you start thinking in time horizons of generations, doing nothing is enormously risky, primarily because of the environmental impacts of the climate change. Green technology innovation and adoption is the only way to mitigate long-term climate change impacts while maintaining the quality of life uh, we used to enjoy. Now, at the same time, uh, while here we are discussing green technology adoption, I, I would also like to emphasize that we are already somewhat late to fully prevent climate change only with mitigation and technology. We also need to invest in adaptation to climate change, and we need to be ready to build back after climate change disasters that unfortunately will happen. In other words, think of the mitigation, adaptation, and build back.